look at how this can uh, negatively impact the firm. Right? So what we want to do is go back to our chapter nine, uh, our intuition, and remember the internal rate of return rule, which says we should accept a project when the internal rate of return of the project is greater than the required return for the firm. Right? So in other words, the project provides more return than the cost of capital for the project, the required return. Now, the, the projects from, we can imagine this is GE, where uh, the, the project at uh, the A level division is a nuclear sub, and the C level division is a light bulb. So if we use the standard IRR rule, and we have already estimated the required rate of return for these projects directly, we can see that we would only accept the projects from B and C, because the internal rate of return is greater than the required return. Right? So C has a profitable project. Its, its risk is really low, so its required return is low, 10%, but its internal rate of return provides value above that. Likewise for B, it has a required rate of return of 15% directly, and its internal rate of return provides some return above that. And we reject A because even its required rate of return is so high, A has so much risk, that even though the project's IRR is pretty good, 17% is pretty high, it's not high enough to justify the risk of taking this project. Now the problem with using WAC when we have differing risk levels across our firm is that WAC is the average and the average is gonna be higher than the low projects. Right? So if I use WAC, I accept A and B instead of accepting C. So instead of the required returns that are listed, replace those required returns with 15%, all of them, because WAC is the required rate of return for the firm. Then the IRR for A, 17% is higher than 15%, I take it. The IRR for B, 18% is higher than 15%, so I take it. But the IRR for C is lower than 15%, so I reject that project. So what does, hopefully now you can see the issue that WAC raises in, in scenarios like this. It caused us to reject a good, albeit low return project. In other words, because we're using the average and I'm only taking on projects that have returns that are higher than average, and Projects with high returns, by definition, have high risk. I am only biasing the firm towards taking only high risk, high return projects. I won't let the firm accept a low risk, but still positive and value creating project like the one for C. Right? New projects by, for GE's light bulb division are extremely low risk. What's a new project for a light bulb division? They make colored light bulbs or they make uh, LED light bulbs, or they make smart light bulbs, right? Those are all projects that a uh, light bulb division might take. But they're all going to be low risk, and they're all going to be low return. But they might still be value creating, as long as their return is greater than their, uh, their project return is still greater than their required return. Using the WAC would cause me to reject those kind of projects. So if I have divisions or projects with differing levels of risk inside of the firm, the WAC is not going to be appropriate to use for as the required return for all projects at the firm. I'm going to have to make some adjustments. And I can do two, one of two things. The first thing is I can try and find another company that only does or specializes in the investment that we're considering. This is called the pure play approach. So a pure play company is a company that only does one thing. So if I'm concerned that I'm rejecting good projects in my light bulb division because my weighted average cost of capital is too high, what I might try and do is see if there's any public firms existing that only make light bulbs. That's a pure play light bulb company. And if I can do that, let's say I can find maybe three other companies that only make light bulbs. If I can calculate their required return, then I can use that as a way to estimate my required return for my light bulb division, right? Cons if I, it's like considering that I, my light bulb division was a standalone company, then its cost of capital would be the required return on the, just the light bulb cash flows. So I find a company that only has light bulbs, makes light bulbs and, and has that exact same level of risk. And then I use their risk as an estimate of my risk. I say, okay, 
they only make light bulbs, they should have the same risk as my light bulb division. Let's use their cost of capital uh, as our, uh, for our project decision making. Now, this might not be a possibility. There might not be any firms that only make light bulbs. Right? Off the top of my head, I can only think of big conglomerates that make light bulbs, like Philips and General Electric. Uh, uh, Syl Sylvia, Sylvain, I don't know. Uh, I can't think of that many light bulbs. It's probably a bad example. Uh, but anyway, it may, you may not be able to find pure play companies. Right? If you are GE and you're doing this on the other side, you're trying to estimate your uh, cost of capital for your uh, nuclear subdivision, it's, you're not going to be able to go out and find a company out there that only makes nuclear submarines because there probably aren't any. So the pure play approach is the best way, but it is not always practical, uh, especially for more niche products that uh, wouldn't have, we wouldn't expect to find uh, individual companies that are only making these products. So the second best option is called the subjective approach. And what we want to do is try to just subjectively estimate the project's risk. So I'll say, okay, I know that the average risk for GE is right in the middle. And I know for sure that the light bulb risks are going to be less than the average. And the submarine, nuclear submarine risk uh, projects are going to be greater than average. I know that's true. So the subjective approach says we recognize that these uh, firms are more or less, or these projects are more or less risky than the average. And we'll take a really easy route to that. We'll take the whack, and if the project is more risky, we will add some subjective uh, amount premium to it. And if the project is less risky, we'll subtract some subjective premium from it, like this. So if the project has the same risk as the firm, we use the whack as the required return. That's what it's designed for. But if the project is much less risky than the average risk as the firm, like the light bulb division, then we'll use the WAC, say, minus 8%. And I just picked these numbers out, out of thin air, right? At, at a real firm uh, and, and in an actual business, you would have a better understanding of, of what the WAC is and what the level of risk for these firm projects are. You would be able to go back and look at all the projects that the light bulb division has ever taken and, and get a better estimate of what the required return should be based on the, the risk that those light bulb divisions actually had. Uh, and we could do likewise for the, the MRI division or the nuclear submarine division. The important part is that the subjective approach is just that, it's subjective. We are not going to have any hard and fast rules here about how many categories we should have or what the premium for each category should be. We're just going to sort of wing it. Okay, light bulbs are less risky, let's take WAC minus 8% and we'll see if we accept any projects based on that level. And we may have to adjust it going forward. And we know nuclear submarines are really risky, so we'll take WAC plus 10% as our required return. That'll make it really difficult for us to accept these really risky projects, and that'll mean that we only take the best projects. And that's the subjective approach. The problem with the subjective approach is precisely that. It's subjective. We, we may end up rejecting good projects here because we don't have the correct estimate of the risk, and so we don't have the correct required return. The problem is, is we can't know that unless we can find a pure play company that where the risk is better estimated. Uh, so uh, the last thing we'll is uh, skip this idea, this talk about flotation costs. Again, we're sort of shortening the class, so I'm cutting some of this stuff. I didn't always cut the slides, um, so uh, just ignore the flotation costs. You won't see that. Uh, and you can ignore the example of the MPV uh, and flotation costs. Uh, so there's some review questions here, things that are important. There's a, a follow-up comprehensive problem, so another WAC problem uh, from start to finish. So uh, I'll be posting that example here. Solutions in the slides. And uh, that's the end, uh, both of the class, end of chapter 14. Um, so uh, you got one more exam coming up. You got uh, no homework for chapter 14, uh, just study for the exam. Uh, you have study materials for the uh, both the third exam directly, and I posted the study guides for the final that we're not taking. Right? So there's all kinds of uh, third and uh, material from the second and third portions of the class, and the first portion of the class. It will probably help you to do the study guide for the final uh, and take the third exam. You will have worked tons and tons of practice problems and material for that.
Okay. Um, so I know this was weird and screwed up and, and such a strange semester, uh, and I, I'm glad you guys stuck through it. Uh, I, I hope you still got uh, at least a fraction of what you would have gotten uh, out of this class. Uh, and I hope you still learned something. Uh, I uh, will leave these up on YouTube, so uh, I guess you'll be the first class that I ever had that can go back and look at the old material if they ever get bored and want to learn more. Um, and uh, if not, then you never have to worry about it or see me again. Uh, so I normally would finish off by you know saying how much I appreciated having you guys in the class, uh, and I still did. Uh, while we were meeting, I, I was having a great time. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll see you again when things are back to normal and we're all back at uh, ASU. Uh, and until then, good luck and, uh, and we'll see you around.